Ma'am, in ten seconds we shall start. I've mm -hmm. turned on the light. Hmm. Okay, Karna. Thank you. Sushil ma'am will begin ma'am. Yes ma'am, no problem, you can begin. Yes, good evening one and all. A warm welcome to all the participants on the second day of the seven day faculty development program on literary theory. Today we have amidst us Dr. Marx, Professor, Department of English, Pondicherry University. I think this is the first time that we as a department are inviting Sir for a lecture in NFDP. Mm, but a few of us have had the good fortune to listen to him a couple of times earlier in refresher programs. I have myself personally heard uh, Sir speak on post-colonial studies and uh, comparative literary studies. And on both those occasions, I can tell you forsooth, that uh, Sir's lectures were one among the best lectures of the entire program. It was so full of information. In fact, he was able to offer some very definitive views on the topic. So we are very fortunate that Sir is here with us today. Thank you, Sir. Uh, his lecture, I'm sure, is going to be so erudite. Thank you. Sir has decided to speak on cultural studies today. And uh, like we discussed yesterday, literary theory is an interdisciplinary body of work and cultural studies being a part of it is also interdisciplinary. Why? Because it tries to uh, trace the relationship among anthropological, social, political uh, aspects of cultural production and cultural reproduction. In fact, uh, cultural studies itself is being used as a tool to theorize the emergence of post-colonial literatures and multicultural literatures. So along with all of you, I'm very eager to listen to Sir's lecture. And now I call upon Mrs. Maheshwari, Associate Professor from the Department of English to welcome the gathering and also to introduce the chief guest of the day. Good luck to all of you. Thank you, Madhangi. Good afternoon, everyone. And I take great pleasure in welcoming you formally to the second day of the FTP program. Today, we have Dr. Marx, professor from the Department of English, Pondicherry University, to talk on cultural studies. Interdisciplinary approach has become the need of the hour in all aspects of the academia and life in order to have a 360 degree view of the quality of life that we live. Cultural studies help us to gain this centrifugal knowledge. As cultural studies helps us gain knowledge of the dynamics of contemporary culture, which in turn helps to understand the complexity of everyday life. We have today Dr. Marx from the Pondicherry University to unravel the density of this domain. Dr. Marx specializes in comparative literature and cultural studies. He has to his credit publication of 10 books in English and two in Tamil. He has in a period of over 10 years organized six conferences and an e-workshop. 
He has published several articles in peer-reviewed international journals. Sir, we welcome you for this FDP program and I'm sure we will, by the end of the day, be rich in the knowledge of culture and its impact on us. I welcome Dr. Sushil Mary Matthews, our head of the department, without whom this event would not have materialized. I welcome Dr. Madhingi, the staff coordinator of the program who has meticulously arranged this lecture series. I welcome all the staff of the parent college and the staff from other institutions and from all other domains who are all ears for this lecture. Once again, I welcome you all for this faculty development program, seven day faculty development program. Thank you. Over to Madhangi. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sir, we can begin now, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So... <clears throat> respected uh, principal of PSG or Krishnamal College for Women, the head of the department of English, um, Dr. Maheshwari, who introduced me and welcomed the gathering. Dr. Madanki, who was literally after me for the last one month to uh, include me in the list of speakers, for this FDP, learned uh, teacher participants, very good evening to you all. When I uh, was invited to this FDP to uh, share some of my views related to any field of literary critical studies, um, I was planning to give uh, a lecture on either new historicism or something related to that. Uh, but then I thought I can give you a lecture on cultural studies because uh, it is uh, more interdisciplinary and very much closely related to uh, trends in literature or tendencies. Um, to literary texts like postmodernism or postcolonialism, new historicism, and a lot more. Um, so that is how I uh, have uh, consented to give a lecture on cultural studies today. To trace the uh, evolution of cultural studies today, I need to go back to a few other uh, literary trends, especially uh, in the um, 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, though cultural studies as a discipline got established only in the post-war period. As, um, uh, as, as uh, many teachers uh, know fully well that cultural studies is um, you know, a kind of uh, movement, literary movement, or, a, or an interdisciplinary uh, movement, or interdisciplinary uh, tendency to uh, deal with uh, literature or culture or um, even sociology of a text, um, you know, taking uh, or, or borrowing many things from the movements that uh, preceded um, cultural studies and uh, even with the evolution of cultural studies and with its development over a, a period of time, it started borrowing heavily from uh, movements that uh, succeeded cultural studies uh, movement. So to start with, um, this is basically a reaction against um, what we call the uh, text-based uh, approach. Uh, uh, you know, isolating a text and then analyzing the text. Uh, this all uh, started with um, the uh, University of Vanderbilt's decision to um, terminate or to punish or to uh, 
to 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 threaten a, a group of English faculty members to uh, to work more to do something concrete to the field of literature. So when there was a threat to the very existence of the English professors belonging to the Vanderbilt University, what happened was um, all these English professors, the scholars of English literary studies, started. um you know dismantling the very structure of a text and uh, uh, and and one person was trying to do something with uh, the paradox uh, another person was trying to do something with uh, irony another person was trying to do something with uh, the meaning uh, likewise you know one um, uh, clean brooks was talking about the paradox and uh, william emson was talking about the types of ambiguity and um, another person was talking about tension intention and extension in four types of meaning seven types of ambiguity and it go it it, it went on um, with with a lot of uh, dismantling of uh, a specific text and analyzing the um, elements of a poem or a, or a, or a text a literary text for that matter so it, it this is what we call the new criticism and this new criticism reduced the value of literature to um, you know to 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 nothing short of a written text printed text so when this is the um, scenario and when when people were trying to valorize this kind of an uh, a literary um, criticism a literary analysis um you know initially there was a school and prior to this kind of a, 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 a new criticism there was a school um in the late uh, 19th century that um, the the comparative literary studies school so unless you know the history of the comparative literary studies school uh, we cannot um properly understand the cultural studies uh, center the center for contemporary cultural studies established by um i mean uh, uh, richard hogarth uh, stuart hall raymond williams gp thompson and others so this kind of a, a, a comparative literary study um department or an academic discipline um aimed at achieving or aimed at tracing the uh, universal value of literature so the the ultimate point of uh, the 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 um the classical criticism or the comparative literary school scholars or the um, or, or or prior to cultural studies scholars all these scholars who were uh, the, the what i call the canonical criticism the canonical critics the scholars belonging to the canonical criticism or the classical criticism they were all aiming at analyzing forms of literature to prove that all literature is one and uh, humanity is one so the um, what go, what what has gone wrong with this kind of a canonical criticism or a, um, the, the classical criticism is the cultural inscriptions in every text is completely uh, forgotten is completely uh, ignored is deliberately neglected um, so what happened is uh, the these scholars who tried analyzing literary texts these scholars were trying to do something in the name of classical criticism the name of new criticism the name of uh, uh canonical criticism these scholars they tried um to say that literature is one and literature should be one bulldozing the differences between texts be, between the uh, between the experiences of human beings irrespective of their race class um say caste culture or whatever it is a gender so the cultural inscriptions in every text is completely neglected um so the 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 universal versus particular in the older uh, domain of literature the, the the perennial conflict between universal versus particular is what uh, we we can uh, refashion the same kind of dichotomy as canonical criticism versus cultural criticism uh, so the the, the 
um, uh, literature gets its value from its cultural specificities. This is the uh, base uh, with which cultural studies actually um, uh, takes off. So what is cultural and what is particular is more important than um, what is universal. So this is, this is the first point which I, uh, I'm trying to uh, you know, inform you. The, the, the first uh, point and the foremost point is that what is cultural, what is specific, what is particular, uh, what is trivial or what has been trivialized is more important than what is, what is magnified, what is glorified in the name of um, canons, in the name of uh, meta-narratives, in the name of uh, grand narratives, in the name of truth, in the name of reality, uh, in, in the name of anything. So the, the, what is universal is important, but what is cultural in particular is much more important than what you find as elements of universality. And um, this is what, you know, um, a, a group of people like um, T.S. Eliot, um, W.B. Yeats, F. R. Lewis, uh, many of the accomplices of T.S. Eliot, you know, they were trying to um, construct the European monumental order. Uh, what what T.S. Eliot himself says, the European monumental order. So when he says, uh, when these people were trying to prove that literature is one and uh, because humanity is one, the, the humanity, the term humanity, which is used by the Eliotian, um, you know, the parade of writers or the scholars uh, is, is nothing but the European Christian humanity, which um, naturally excluded the Arabs, the Indians, the Chinese, and many other nationals. So this kind of a not, not an all-inclusive kind of a term, uh, humanism uh, as one, and hence literature should be one, the argument uh, becomes flawed and um, it, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes a flawed argument and it becomes a fraud exercised on um, the, the so-called illiterate people or the so-called uncivilized masses. So the, uh, the, the term masses, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to construct another uh, binary that when you say that this kind of an European Christian humanity is one and aiming at the universal value of literature on one hand, and on the other hand, the civilizing mission of the West and uh, branding the, branding the uh, Orient, the uh, the the uh, the East as the barbaric uh, masses, uh, or or within the West itself, you have another dichotomy of um, the the uh, civilized versus the uncivilized, or the educated elites versus the uneducated masses. So the term masses, you know, the the, the common people, the lay people, or or people with native genius, people with native intellect. These people and their experiences were uh, collectively trivialized and sometimes neglected and dwarfed into insignificance by these elite, elitist discourses. So what happened with this old comparative literature school is um, these people chose two different texts from two different uh, geographical spaces, two different nations, two different um, languages, and they were trying to compare uh, uh, the chosen texts, and they were trying to bring out the similarities between these two texts, only to prove that humanity is one again. And uh, there was a political necessity for Eliot and his group because uh, in the post-war period, the uh, people have lost their faith in God and uh, the, the whole Europe uh, has become a wasteland, to, to use the, word, the title of the um, the the, uh, the uh, mega poem of T.S. Eliot. So when it is barren, when barrenness uh, prevailed across Europe, you know the uh, political necessity uh, for uh, reaffirmation of faith, you know, of of, of, of man over God um, was actually facilitated by T.S. Eliot and 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 uh, the scholars of comparative literary studies. And these people were trying to. Um, 
bring out the similarities, bring out the uniformities, bring out the universality uh, of uh, any canonical text. But what happened with the advent of uh, the third world, the fourth world, or, or the post-colonial nations, the scholars belonging to the non-Western um, you know, uh, spaces, the uh, the 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 um, the, uh, uh, the the non-Western intellectuals uh, who got some kind of connections or go, who got kind of space within the Western academia, these people uh, tried to bring out the flaws in this specific um, so very important school called the Comparability Study School. So they were pointing out a serious flaw in the Comparative Literary Studies School that uh, when they choose two different texts from two different contexts, um, the specific non-Western context is missing. So what we were trying to do is a reunification of Europe as a, a single um, world, a single world uh, you know, becomes the uh, objective of the uh, uh, comparative literary studies school. So, um, uh, and, and when you try to build out the uh, differences, um, you know, because uh, uh, that is why new uh, comparative literary studies scholars, even when they started borrowing texts from the non-Western uh, countries, what they did was they borrowed the text from the, I mean, canonical text from the non-Western spaces. So uh, again, they were involved in an elitist, uh, you know, choice, an elitist uh, selection of texts. And uh, again, they were trying to do the same kind of thing that um, uh, Ilango, Adigal, and Shakespeare, or uh, uh, both the tragic vision of both becomes one. So humanity is one. So this is how they uh, continued with this kind of a, a, a mission of um, tracing the universal element in two different pieces of literature or in more uh, pieces of literature. So um, the cultural studies scholars, what they were trying to do is they want to they want to give importance to the specificities to minute, um, you know, what you call minute uh, cultural um, relics, uh, cultural uh, objects, cultural practices, the, the routine, the, the routine or the mundane, what has been neglected as the mundane uh, has been given prominence uh, against what has been given um, a timeless kind of uh, uh, an action. So what we, what we spit is also cultural is culture. When we spit, all human beings spit. But culture is available in everything we do and the way we spit. And, um, you know, it, it matters a lot. And literature's uniqueness should be brought out um, instead, of, instead of bringing out the universe selves. So all of us eat. Uh, uh, and the way we eat, uh, which way we, um, you know, eat, with whom we eat, how we eat, uh, all these things matter a lot than uh, the very act of eating something. So the, um, you, you cannot say that all human beings eat and hence it is universal. It's not universal. Uh, a person who eats with his hands, uh, you, know, um, you know, keeping rice in a, on, a, on a banana leaf is so different from a person who keeps uh, a bowl of uh, pani puri and eats it with a spoon. There are uh, so you 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 are trying to you are trying to homogenize these two experiences. You are trying to homogenize a lot of such experiences. You are trying to homogenize thousands of eating habits into one uh, under the pretext that uh, all eating is one. So the 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 empirical uh, realism versus the transcendental idealism. This is the conflict that was going on. Uh, in that specific uh, point in time and our forms of knowledge are determined by our own uh, historical, our own cultural, um, our, own, our own social. So this, um, the, the, the ultimate point is knowledge and truth are related to power. So what happens, groups contesting, um, see there are, there are several groups contesting in a single culture itself. So when you have Tamil culture, 
it's it's not a homogeneous tamil culture when you say um, kerala culture it is not a homogeneous kerala culture when you when you say bengali culture it's you don't have a homogeneous uh, singular bengali culture several groups would be con- contesting in a single culture within within a specific culture so discourse is when when several groups are contesting in a single culture um several discourses are contesting or vying with each other in a single culture so what happens when too many groups when too many uh, subcultures when too many discourses are contesting in a single culture dominant groups and dominant discourses uh, become canonical texts so um when you say tamil literature there is no tamil literature at all you know the, under the name of tamil literature the only the dominant groups is writings and the dominant uh, discourses are uh, um, you know you know grouped uh, as the canonical tamil literature so when you talk about then then how come you have uh, regional literatures like karisa literature you have kongu literature and you have nele literature you have nanjil literature Uh, you know these literatures form a common kind of thing called tamil literature but uh, when you say all literatures or tamil or are part of tamil literature then you become a, 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 an old comparative literary studies scholar when you try to um, trace the differences the the uh, the the nuances the minor the minority uh, uh, discourses the minor discourses within a specific culture then you become a cultural studies scholar i hope you uh, you you can easily understand now what is exactly cultural studies it is nothing but uh, it, it it is an anti canonical study it is an anti um, it is it is an anti uh, you know a classical study so it 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 actually um, the the canonical criticism or the canonical text versus change uh, one should understand that so because it is uh it it says knowledge is transcendentally determined uh, that's why um when when referring to um south asian society especially indian society karl marx um, refers uh, to this specific uh, society as a fossil like society uh, which which never ever uh, encounters um wishes to encounter any kind of change so uh, the the Uh, the cultural criticism records the changes um, in a specific culture by doing so it records the changes in uh, power related to culture so the the changes in the changes in power the power struggles the power changes related to a culture so which uh, a, a culture um, you know when a text is considered as frozen the the classical criticism is frozen criticism because if it is transcendentally determined then it is frozen so when you talk about um, nora of henry gibson and uh, kanagi of the uh, of ilango um, adigal uh, and and when you say both are uh, both are heroines of tragedies and both are um, oppressed and both rebel against uh, the the uh, phallocentrism or patriarchal customs we are actually killing the particulars uh, when we when we consider nora as a western counterpart of kanagi or kanagi as uh, uh, um, an oriental counterpart of nora the whole um, the, the very specificity of kanagi the very specificity of nora slamming the door against her husband herma uh, uh we are we are killing the particular cultural value by making it universal so when you are trying to um, homogenize the experiences of two when you try to establish that these two are universal uh, there is a problem in it the, the so in, in which sense when you say this uh, tamil say for example tamil cultural value in which sense it is a product of its culture literature uh, gets its value from its universals or from the cultural if you answer this you can get the very objective of the cultural studies school uh, the, the second important thing is uh, um, 
um, scholars try to um, say that this cultural studies movement suffers from a biographical fallacy because it talks more about the context of uh, a text. Say, for example, who is this writer? Where is he from? Uh, why did he write this? What prompted him to write this? What were the, um, you know, under which this writer has produced this text? So when you, when you are tracing all these, when you are trying to answer all these questions, or when you raise all these questions, um, you know, sc scholars uh, who detest cultural studies, they say that it suffers too much from this biographical fallacy. But then the, the answer to this kind of an accusation is that it's not a family. We are not trying to trace the family history of another. We are not trying to uh, talk about the birthplace of another. We are not trying to talk about uh, um, for whom he was born and what kind of a relationship he had with the X or Y. These are not the concerns of the cultural studies movement, but it's not a family that matters, but the social cultural milieu that matters a lot because 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 a writer is politically sensitive. Of course, there will be a temptation to unite the text. It's, it's always there. The temptation to unite the text is always there and um, you, one needs to overcome this temptation to unite the text because every text records the changes. Every text possesses the power changes. What um, lied beneath the text is not important. But why is it, why is it lying behind? Why is it so discreet is very, very important. So this is uh, uh, the, the ultimate uh, second point of my lecture is uh, the, the meaning of a text is not traditionally or transcendentally determined. It is determined by the historical conditions of a culture. So there was a shift from the divine appropriary to the cultural appropriary. So it's, it's not God who uh, supplied meanings to the text or to the, to the language employed in the text, but rather it is the culture, the, the specific culture that provides its meanings. So the, the, the old uh, school of scholars were trying to uh, construct a kind of universality, which is nothing but a make-believe. When you when you say um, uh, an X in India and a Y in the United States, both are uh, both are same because both are uh, human beings and both their experiences uh, should be uh, uniform because humanity is one and literature should be uh, one. This kind of a make belief uh, universality was marketed very successfully and it was uh, put to rigorous examination by. Uh, both by the new comparative literary studies scholars and also for, by the uh, Center for um, Contemporary Cultural Studies. Um, so another example I give you the the when you when you say um, say when you when you compare Tony Morrison and um, Shakespeare for that matter, and when you say both are uh, both are dealing with the same kind of uh, experience, human experiences, that is a, that, uh, you know you know. Uh, um, considering Tony Morrison an equal to Shakespeare itself is absurd because um, all human beings smile, all our behavior gets meanings. Uh, the way I smile and the way you smile both can't be uh, equal because um, the, the same way, you know, when, when somebody says with folded hands, Namaskar, the complexity of the very action called Namaskar, the folded hands, carries several meanings in several contexts. In, in, in the Tamil context, it is something very much hierarchically graded. When somebody folds, uh, welcomes somebody with a folded hand, the person's positionality uh, is very much inferior to the person who uh, uh, receives it. This is not reciprocal in uh, a feudal culture. So this uh, kind of an action, this kind of a um, a, a very mundane activity um, ha cannot be cannot be uniform, cannot be universal in all spaces. So, uh, see, what's the use of changing a protagonist or a hero into a universal figure? That is that is something very meaningless. So, this kind of a 
um, you know, uh, the, the, the post-colonial um, writers, as well as a few postmodern writers uh, are concerned with two important things in uh, the, the 20th century, that is the culture and history. Uh, despite the, the, the fact that postmodern writers have been, um, have been um, accused of relegating history to the dustbin um, of, of an outmoded episteme, because they considered history as nothing. It's, 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 it's something, uh, they, they threw it to the dustbin of an outmoded and outdated episteme. But it has been uh, persuasively uh, argued that they merely serve to complicate history, uh, to, to contest history, to challenge history, to challenge the notion of history. Um, and, and ultimately they prove that there is no history, but there are histories. So the, the, the culture is seen by postmodernists as a nuanced negotiation of meaning across institutions. And their, uh, their focus is so with how it manifests itself in everyday life. So though, though his, uh, I mean the, uh, the, the starting point of cultural studies uh, group, the starting point uh, of uh, the, the cultural studies school, um, you know, uh, happens to be Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, Richard Hoggart, and A.P. Thompson. This is Richard Haggard, uh, the starting point is Karl Marx, whose concept of base superstructure is reinterpreted uh, uh, by Raymond Williams. And one of the uh, two or three most uh, you know, difficult or most complicated terms in the English language happens to be culture. <coughs> So what is uh, culture? What is culture and why do we talk about culture this much um, importantly in this specific uh, period? So Raymond Williams uh, claims that in culture, cultural practice and cultural creation are not only uh, derivatives of a created social order, but are major constituents by themselves in themselves. So it, it, it's a kind of signifying system through which a social system is conveyed, say reproduced and explored rather than uh, considering it as an informing spirit within the society. So during the um, 1950s and 60s, the West's uh, um, intellectual history was dominated by um, linguistic uh, you know, terms say uh, the, the, the very objective of postmodernism is to question the notion of language and its, uh, and its, and its uh, constructed meaning. So what postmodernism was trying to do uh, can be very, very crisply exam you know, explained in uh, two uh, different ways. One, uh, it was trying to um, say that what, what you perceive as reality is relative. So there is no such thing called reality. And um, whatever reality you are trying to perceive is your own reality and you are trying to generalize it. So there is no such thing called reality because reality is relative. So what is good for you may be bad for me and what is uh, beautiful uh, for you uh, can be very ugly or, or detestable for me. So this uh, reality is relative. And number two, it uh, even if we assume that reality can be understood, perceived, and can be which, then comes another important problem or more serious problem that uh, whatever we try to uh, express as an expression of reality cannot be um, cannot be rightfully expressed, cannot be uh, perfectly expressed through language, because language suffers from a lot of uh, a lot of problems, inherent problems, um, and 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 that is further subdivided into two, saying that language, um, whatever we try to express, language suffers from two different diseases two different problems, two different lacunas. One is its, um, it's, its problem with 
uh, the the unexplainability, and so you cannot explain reality um, in 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 singular terms, because uh, that is the problem with the traditional um, setup where you know the uh, say for example the the the, the traditional value of communication when somebody passes away in a village and you need to uh, pass on this uh, death news across one person from a village will have a bicycle or he'll be given a bicycle and he'll be uh, sent across some 16 to 20 villages to pass on the passing away of the news of the passing away of somebody and that person is the news carrier of the village and uh, one and only quality for that specific person is nothing but loyalty and uh, truthfulness so if he tells a lie or if he uh, is a rumor monger if he um, narrates a story about some incident to other villages that that is the end of his career and he cannot so the possible condition for employing this kind of a person is he should be a native of that place so that he cannot uh, play uh, with the sentiments of people and escape from the place but then with um, the uh, with the, with the late capitalism what happened you know one specific single incident um, has been interpreted in several ways 10 15 news channels spreading the same news in 20 different ways uh, we all know how many times uh, um, the news channels killed uh, the ltt supremo prabhakaran we all know how many times sp bal subramaniam was killed so the, the the way in which the veracity of certain facts and realities um, you know thrown to the public uh, you know in 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 the um, through the mode of language that is completely um, an impossible thing so it can't be explained uh, in singular terms Number two, it's inexpressibility. Even when you try to explain social reality um, or reality, in, you know, language uh, cannot express whatever you try to express in its way. So that is why um, when somebody says rose is a rose is a rose, jet root stain, uh, he suffers, he, he understands that language uh, is a disabled kind of unit because it it doesn't it, it couldn't express what i what i try to express um you know uh, uh, when when i try to say the rose is the beautiful flower in the world i couldn't express it um you know uh, correlative with my imagination because language is a handicap for me so this kind of uh, a linguistic turn of the, the notion of language, the notion of singularity, the notion of truth. Uh, what you what you read today um, in in post truth studies, because in traditional uh, disciplines, uh, truth was God supplied and truth was very concrete. And now um, you know, with with postmodernism, the notion of truth was de-established. The notion of truth was challenged. The notion of truth was contested. But uh, with post truth studies now. Uh, it, it talks about the post uh, LPG, the post globalization, mass communication, um, you know, cyber uh, spaces, where it uh, talks about uh, lies masquerading themselves as truth uh, in, in in modern societies. So this is much more dangerous than uh, than than um, the the uh, illusion of truth. So when lies constructing themselves as disguising themselves as masquerading themselves as truths um, that specific act is you know umpteen number of times uh, more dangerous than believing something uh, the illusion of reality as reality so this kind of a, a, a linguistic turn was in the 1950s 1960s and um, the, the west intellectual history was dominated by that and it is now dominated by the cultural turn, the cultural shift. So the, 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 um, in, the, in the preceding century, literature um, or, or what you call culture or what we understood as culture was nothing but uh, art, literature, um, classical music. These were all predominantly connected with culture. So in, in, in broad terms, uh, when you when you call something as cultural in a in a college like this, um, what we understood by the very term culturals 
not now, you know, uh, years before the advent of cultural studies or um, the real understanding of culture, people um, used to think that it is a function where people will perform, uh, uh, recite a piece of poem, um, narrate um, a story, um, sing a classical song. Um, you know, these are all certain things which uh, we readily, uh, you know, understand as culture or, or an element of culture. So in broad terms, it refers to um, different ways of living and social expression. So after the advent of this uh, new field of study known as cultural studies, our own culture has become a problematic notion, especially not in the field of literature, but in the field of social sciences as well. So when we talk about, or when we start talking about history, when we start talking about sociology of a writer or a book, when we start talking about anthropology, when we start talking about philosophy of technology, philosophy of, um, or philosophy from below, or, or writings from below, or history from below, uh, the, the authoritative scholars of the concerned disciplines grew very much angry, grew very much, um, you know, um, upset with this kind of an interdisciplinary study. So this kind of a relatively um, new field of study um, reflects a kind of shift in scholarly attitudes towards literature and cultural, literary and cultural um, themes. So what happens with this kind of a, um, a political epistemology, this uh, which, which maintains, this is my third important point, knowledge is never a neutral, objective um, thing. So the, the, what the canonical <coughs> writers, what the canonical texts were trying to do is uh, through, through uh, anything and everything, they wanted to prove that knowledge is a neutral, highly objective thing. But the cultural studies uh, scholars try to prove that knowledge is never a neutral, objective thing, but rather a result of the positionality of one's receiving and speaking location, which one can find um, more powerful in Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak's uh, essay. Uh, can the subaltern speak? So cultural studies is, um, uh, is, is defined as the study of popular culture um, in addition to its um, issue of positionality. It's, it's the positionality that matters. From where I am speaking, uh, am I speaking from the imperial uh, empire and writing all my plays like uh, what Shakespeare did? Am I writing my text under the stress of writing in the midnight, dictating notes to my daughters when I am blind, like in the case of Milton? You know, where from you write your text, where from you produce your text, the positionality matters a lot. And this kind of um, the issue of positionality uh, is furthered by its study of popular cultures. So it began as a reaction to the, the claim, the cultural relativism and um, of, of a populist reaction to the elitism of older forms of literary studies. It, it's, it's very simple that it is um, a reaction against the elitism uh, because you called uh, the, the non-elites as the masses. The masses are trying to, uh, trying, to, trying to come up and they are trying to interpret certain things using the cultural uh, nuances, the cultural artifacts, the, like, like the way though um, John Osborne doesn't belong to the working class, he uh, in fact produced a wonderful text, Look Back in Anger. Though he doesn't belong to the working class, he belongs to the Angry Men group, which was essentially a working class uh, group. And this kind of, uh, uh, the, 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 though uh, culturalism as a, a phenomenon was developed by writers uh, such as Matthew Arnold, T.S. Eliot, F.R. Louise, uh, who saw culture as a source of inspiration for their works, they value outstanding art and uh, they, they, they try to valorize the high culture. When you say something as high culture, you have already 
neglected or you have already uh, prepared yourself to um, to 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 push a set of um, you know cultures as low cultures so these people tried to valorize high culture and certain noble traditions you know high art and till they, they take an aristocratic approach to literature so this elitist approach to literature so in the in the especially the uk marxist literary uh, theory um, especially the new lefts uh, um remember the new left is icon antonio gramsci and his concept of hegemony has made a significant contribution to uh, the cultural study contemporary cultural studies and um, especially ep thompson seek to revive um, uh, and analyze a popular working class culture um you know you know what these people were trying to do is the recovery of the last voices and reading history from below so for the first time in uh, in human history um it was only ep thompson and uh, uh, his followers you know who uh, for the first time talked about um insisted that the disenfranchised people uh, the marginalized people uh people uh, who were branded as non conformists these people should also have their spaces in the 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 uh, discourses so this kind of a, a contact with uh, and 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 nourishing the marginalized culture so while defining culture and cultural um, studies uh, modern cultural critic francis mulhern highlights two uh, important mutually antagonistic traditions of discourse one is the uh, german uh, culture critique which is uh, which 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 refers to um, the the which refers to the cultural elitism and the second thing is the cultural studies so uh, uh, by this kind of a mutually antagonistic uh, unit so you can easily understand that cultural studies uh, is actually um, anti canonical studies or anti cultural elitism so cultural studies has exhibited a powerful interest in um, socio politically oppressed and subjugated groups um, with with a special emphasis on issues of class race gender and nationality so uh, uh, it's it's an academic study that considers culture as a form of anti um capitalist resistance so uh, um, you know as you as you um, you know many of you are teachers and uh, you would have read um, several things about the cultural studies school uh, it was it was founded by richard hogarth uh, and he was the first director of the um, university of birmingham which the center for contemporary cultural studies he criticized the narrowness with which english literature was taught in the united kingdom um when 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 people uh, in the non western countries were actually glorifying the the study of english literature so quite ironically uh, when english literature was introduced in india um you know it was it was it was done with the purpose with a with a very strong political purpose of enslaving people uh and and even in his minute on education lord macaulay was clearly mentioning it that we are trying to create a new class a, a, an agency class uh, who will be uh, who will be serving uh, as a liaison between as the uh, rulers and the subjects and the citizens the ruled uh, so so they should be uh, the the subjects should be taught english literature because you know even in england um, terry eagleton and george godan uh, all these raymond williams all these marxists were very clearly tracing the introduction of english literature into the curriculum uh, they said english literature was first established not in the universities or colleges or not even in schools but only in factories especially for working class members um to soothe them to soften them to humanize them so this kind of humanizing the literature playing the role of a humanizing agent 
uh, was experimented in the colonial nations as well. So this kind of um, a, a, a study, a, a kind of uh, disorientation towards the English literary studies um, resulted in the creation of the new cultural studies. So uh, Hoggart, like Raymond Williams, um, you know, uh, knew firsthand that how it felt to move from the working class to university circles in a, a country where, um, you know, a sharply differentiated system of public-private education. Like in India, you have, um, whenever people meet each other, the first question the parent asks for, uh, to the other parent is whether your daughter or son is uh, um, studying in a, uh, in, a, in a state board or a metric board or an, uh, what do you call uh, the, the uh, central board, you know, the CBSC or um, the um, ISC, international board, which board your children, uh, you know, are studying. This kind of a, a, a hierarchically graded um, social and ed educational system uh, was there in the uh, UK as well. And both these individuals, Raymond Williams and Richard Hogart, uh, they were from underprivileged families and they were able to attend universities. Uh, Hogart went to Leeds University, Williams went to Cambridge University um, during a time when most children in England left school at the age of 15. So this kind of an autobiographical um, the reason is also behind the, uh, I mean, their, their basic uh, action of reacting against the elitist uh, tendency towards culture and society and literature. So Eliot, um, you know, T.S. Eliot, like people, they 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 uh, try to see the need for elites, and Eliot even uh, goes to uh, goes on to justify the need for elites, or rather, an elite. And he argues that in order to maintain general continuity of history, we must maintain social classes, particularly. Uh, a ruling social class with whom the elite will overlap and interact frequently. Uh, so Eliot's conclusion is inherently very, very conservative in that, uh, in that manner. Uh, so uh, when, when these people were trying to question this elitism, uh, say um, two important texts uh, uh, actually, um, you know, catapulted the whole literary landscape or critical landscape from uh, this canonical criticism to cultural criticism. Um, it was uh, Richard Hogarth's The Uses of Literacy and Culture and Society by Raymond Williams. And two more books, two more books um, added to it. Again, Raymond Williams is The Long Revolution and E.P. Thompson's uh, Making of the English Working Class. So these uh, texts were very, very, very crucial in determining the uh, direction of cultural studies issues um, in the first few years after the center's um, establishment. So these books shared a uh, concern for the working classes, social and cultural struggle, redefining old aristocratic concepts of education and creating a common culture that encompassed popular or mass mediated culture. So the, um, uh, the, the center is this reassessment of popular culture, uh, which had previously been seen as merely um, an ideological vehicle for, um, for inflicting dominant paradigms of experience and um, say um, culture and class-based assumptions. Uh, you know, beneficial to maintain the status quo. So say, for example, when you make films like, uh, I mean, Indian film industry itself is very, very feudal. Uh, and South Indian film industry is much more feudal, uh, which justifies, um, you know, enslavement of women by um, relatively upper class men, uh, enslavement of male workers in the fields and in, in, in the agricultural lands by the landlords. All these
sir, we can't hear you. We do have your video, but we can't hear you, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You are audible now, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So with with, with these with these um, uh, the, the the making of these films uh, justifying the uh, the the process of um, uh, exploitation and the very uh, status uh, quo, you know that uh, uh, that that actually uh, these films serve the purpose of maintaining the status quo. Uh, so this status quo was disturbed when um, when 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 um, when filmmakers try to make films, um, you know, dismantling the very structure, the feudal structure of films, and when they try to bring uh, heroes or protagonists from the working class, from the oppressed sections. Um, the the recent example is. Um, uh, the the emergence of new set of filmmakers like um, Paranjit or Mari Selvaraj, um, um, you know Nyanvel and uh, Vetimaran and others. So th this is how the uh, and and Stuart Hall uh, was actually trying to highlight four important elements that uh, that that helped um, you know the. Uh, the, the establishment of cultural studies as a break from the established approaches to the uh, the, the communication related research. Uh, number one, um, cultural studies marked a kind of uh, departure from the previous research techniques, uh, the behavioristic, uh, the behavioristic um, emphasis, which viewed um, media or or media uh, or mediated effect as a direct stimulus response mechanism. Um, so this kind of uh, the the um, performer audience kind of relationship was disturbed, and uh, it, it's it's not a stimulus response mechanism with which you should measure the mediated messages. It's not direct. It is rather. Uh, it's it's rather um, you know uh, very much discreet. Uh, it, it's not it's not uh, overt, but it's covert. And there are a lot of stereotypes um, constructed and floated across by these um, by these hegemonic forces. Uh, so the emphasis at the uh, center turned dramatically toward considering. Uh, mediated uh, content, mediated uh, content, media related content, uh, mediated content as wide, all pervasive social and political forces with indirect, subtle, uh, and even invisible influence. Um, secondly, the concepts of media texts or literary texts as transparent barriers of meanings. Uh, this was also challenged by the cultural uh, studies uh, group. In a, in a broad formalistic tone, you can find Marshall McLuhan making a very historic statement that the medium is the message. So at the, at the, um, even as at, it, the, at its time of origin, British cultural studies um, broke with the passive and undifferentiated concepts of the audience as such. And finally, the center rejected the idea of mass culture as a homogeneous reality, uh, instead focusing on the mass media's role in disseminating and uh, cementing dominant ideological conceptions and representations. So the, the, the center always, uh, the cultural studies always focused on communication in the broadest sense um, say defining it as the systems of culturally mediated social relations uh, between classes. So, um, so this can be uh, this understanding of cultural studies can be furthered to um, food studies, uh, fat studies, um, hair studies, um, toiletology, and many such things. So every uh, country has its own uh, 
uh, food traditions, taste and constraints. Uh, food has always attracted critical attention from, um, you know, fields such as social security, sustenance, economics, uh, human rights, gastronomy, and, and, and so on and so forth. But then uh, the, the point which cultural studies, uh, you know, uh, is trying to uh, make with regard to uh, these cultural artifacts is food uh, is a socio-cultural icon, is a socio-cultural uh, center that is closely connected with the diverse activities and affiliations that form a community. So uh, what happens when um, as a result, you know, food began to take on uh, implications beyond those of a mere body filler, um, embedding concepts such as uh, cultural identity, social hierarchy, um, and societal validation. Food, 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 food becomes an intrinsic part of the discourses that generates all types of, uh, you know, diverse types of social organization as uh, a potent means of social control. Um, you may wonder how food can be a means of social control. It, it is a potent means of social control and uh, a social means of uh, enslavement of uh, subaltern classes. Um, as a result, what happens in you know, a food, uh, possession of food and deprivation of food um, plays a vital role in oppression exploitation and disenfranchisement. It is intricately linked with concerns of identity development as, as a cultural narrative. Uh, say, uh, be it uh, Dr. Ambedkar's um, uh, Mahad Satyagraha, where he uh, led people towards the Chauda tank, you know, to fetch water from the public well. Uh, because because food was um, inextricably uh, formed along the alignment of inclusion and exclusion. So this, um, the, and then the question of denial of food to marginalized groups and, um, and, and dining together with privileged caste groups is uniformly followed in all culinary cultures of India. Uh, say in the socially, in, in, in the hands of the socially powerful um, classes or socially powerful caste, food becomes an apparatus. It's, it's not just a body filler, it's, it becomes an apparatus of uh, social control as it has the power to decide uh, with whom one can eat and to deny a larger population its legitimate share also. So in, in um, see the patronizing mindset of the feudalistic society stems from the uh, ability to provide food. I'm, I have the ability to provide you food and hence I have the patronizing mindset. I have the patronizing attitude. Very good example uh, to prove this is the, um, the, the plight of the 46 Dalit landless laborers burnt alive uh, by um, a landlord named uh, uh, Gopal Krishna Naidu, uh, which got represented in a literary work Indra Patasarabhis is the river of blood. And what happened there, you know, the producers of paddy, the peasants, the working class, they were forced to ask the landowners for a few more vessels of rice. So people, common readers, without cultural studies understanding, may think what is wrong in uh, providing them with one more vessel of rice or why these, uh, why these working class members lost their lives just for uh, just for one more vessel of rice but this uh, you know you know the uh, the the culmination of uh, i mean the murders where the culmination of a laborers the working classes campaign for improved uh, improved working conditions improved salaries um, and children were among the victims who were burnt alive in their hearts when uh, when when an important land or the, the leading um, president of the Paddy uh, Producers Association and his goons, mercenaries, uh, burnt the, uh, the, the hut and killed 46 laborers. So the, um, uh, to suppress the voice of opposition, the response was unimaginably harsh. 
and uh, why should we labor so hard for just one more measure of paddy this was the question raised and which gave the uh, which which gave birth to the communist revolution and the birth of communist movement itself in uh, tamil nadu same is the case with many other incidents like um, in 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 kerala also the image of kerala uh, as um, i mean the, the the culinary image of kerala as uh, an appam and beef curry uh, state uh, you know prevails outside the state but vegetarianism um, is so dominant in kerala and vegetarian feasts are dominantly served in kerala um, even after the inter dining Uh, initiatives taken by sagodara nayakan and other revolutionaries um, even in these revolutionary inter dining uh, occasions um, and in inter dining events sadhya the vegetarian uh, popular vegetarian dish uh, used to be served as a common food for all so this 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 food serves as a logo of cultural diversity and social unity and it also becomes a source of division and discrimination um same is the case with uh, the, the concept of biryani in tamil nadu or in, in throughout india you have uh, um, you know biryani has always been heavily demonized um it it has been vilified by um, politicians across um say in pondicherry there is a saying uh, especially during elections or nooru or soru or beer which means uh, 100 rupees and uh, full meals or biryani and a bottle of beer will uh, sway the elections so biryani has been um, used as a semiotic force uh, you know and and it is since it is associated with the islamic uh, tradition and has non um, you know non non vedic undertones the uh, politicians the mainstream politicians is constant references to biryani um strengthen a very uh, detestable culinary imagination in india mm-hmm. so and 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 there are a lot of um, you know uh, such references we can give for uh, food related things and um, similarly in arundhati rice's the god of small things if you um, read very carefully the cultural uh, nuances are much more important and only when you read arundhati rice the god of small things from the cultural studies perspective um, you can understand what she actually uh, uh, you know tried at uh, the writing of the god of small things uh, of course it shows the uh, contradictions in post colonial india especially in kerala uh, through the through the life of kerala she is trying to show the contradiction just as kerala becomes the microcosmic element of india uh, the house of imnm uh, becomes the microcosm of kerala and it becomes the uh, site and the symbol of a, a post colonial society haunted by certain taboos and fears and is almost a participant in the story of transgressions and betrayals so it, it, you all know that it is all about uh, kerala of the 1960s um with with um, throws of naxalite activity and it focuses on the lives of a syrian christian family and uh, dalit community uh, the affair between amu and uh, velutha the the dalit forms the plot and amu is also a marginalized woman but um relatively velutha belongs to the lord and in the deepen of post colonial um india which is otherwise an ever colonized nation is found in and around amu uh, in kerala it is marxism the new um, revolutionary so called revolutionary religion of kerala betrays velutha the dalit in the novel um, kvm play the typical marxist leader uh, betrays him first and then exploits his death to induce uh, the workers to strike work and so every uh, trivial thing in a work say another example i can give from the mems is um, uh, beast of burden uh, where the uh, the the daughter of the protagonist uh, was um, i mean the daughter of sauri um, uh, she was raped by a relatively upper caste fellow and um, <coughs> 
uh, after raping her uh, of or after being raped the girl was asking the rapist to pull her dress with a long stick and that fellow was shouting at her what nonsense how can i touch your dress you come and take your dress and wear you know this is how when when he uh, could rape the girl uh, you know no untouchability was there so when when his uh, when his senses are dominant when his sensuousness was dominant you know uh, caste and the the issue of untouchability caste superiority all these things are crucified when the rape is almost done and when his job is done and again caste resurrects itself this is uh, the, the 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 ways and means in which uh, the the writers are trying to put forth uh, certain uh, trivial cultural aspects uh, which can be understood only by uh, market differences not by searching for the universals same is the case with indra parthasar thesis nandan um the 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 struggle of nandan is in a way universal because patasarathi points out the cruel practice of untouchability uh, which destroys the life of nandan um the story of nandan i don't know how many of you uh, have read it um nandan wants to enter the village uh, the mainstream village to see uh, abirami his lover but uh, she, who belongs to the upper caste Uh, but he hesitates because uh, he being a, a dalit man is not supposed to enter the village that time you know he could hear the uh, the dogs barking and he says uh, the dog can enter the mainstream village uh, but me a man i am more i am more vulgar than a dog vulgar is a wrong translation but uh, in the text it is translated as vulgar man is more vulgar than a dog so nandan meets abirami and uh, he decides to enter all temples as the upper caste hindus uh, do but the brahmins realize that if they prevent him uh, more people will support him in the protest uh, the temple entry protest so they um, uh, you know they 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 claim that nandan is blessed by the god so he can marry abirami and enter the temple uh, by plunging into the fire so nandan uh, who has been sensitive you know towards protest and other things he falls a prey to the sinister plans and he dies in the fire along with abirami so this kind of um, Uh, i mean nandan is destroyed uh, by being glorified so the same is the case uh, in the god of small things of arundhati rai when she talks about the um, syrian catholic christian lady and her twins as well as a dalit mm. so these are all certain uh, certain examples i am giving you and 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 when it comes to uh, the the problem of uh, i mean the studies uh, that that uh, um that has surfaced again uh, hair politics um, how hair acts as a powerful signifier in many discourses say religion sexuality culture gender race um, etc so uh, how in the realm of religion hair becomes an effective weapon uh, to to enforce social control um, because in india if you have a long top tuft you know behind your social status is elevated if you if you have the same top of front of your forehead then you belong to the lowest caste so the hair stands as a yardstick to find the most inevitable uh, social binary the state of being inside the norms and outside the norms and 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 uh, hair again like food is considered to be the most effective tool to implement social control for example um say uh, the monks the monks um soldiers the uh, convicts or tonsured uh, their hair in order to signify the rigidity of the rules which control them uh, people are often tonsured as a form of punishment and um, a dehumanization process in the case of war uh, prisoners convicts um sometimes hair is removed from the heads of slaves as a sign of servitude 
um, uh, and, and in India also you have, um, in the case of upper caste uh, Hindu widows, um, you know, the, the persecuted prostitutes um, uh, symbolizing restricted sexuality, you know, a detachment from the material world and, um, you know, to, to deprive them of all the pleasures of life, they are tonsured. So the dichotomy in the status of the hair, uh, whether it is tied or untied, runs parallel with the status of uh, the woman, whether she is submissive or deviant, angel or whore. So these are all um, certain examples which I uh, try giving you to, I mean, for you to understand um, what is cultural studies and what are the uh, what are the elements of cultural studies, what are the uh, theoretical basis of cultural studies and how it reacted against structuralism as a discipline. Uh, because they, they even laughed at the structuralist because the canonical um, writers and the classical uh, writers were trying to um, write, uh, produce a text, you know, keeping a structure in their mind, uh, whereas the structuralists were trying to do it after the production of the text. So that's the only uh, difference between the classical writers and the structuralists. And this much, you know, they, they laugh at uh, the structuralists and they uh, try to dismantle the, uh, the structure by uh, bringing out the cultural nuances, by bringing out the cultural meanings, by bringing out the discrete ways in which uh, power has played its, uh, it, it, its role uh, in, the, in the meaning making process um, and, and, and in the creation of certain hegemonic discourses. These are all um, certain important things one should keep in mind uh, when one tries to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, encounter a text, assess a text using um, a, a cultural studies point of view. So I sum up uh, the the, uh, the predominant points uh, which one should keep in their mind uh, when one uh, tries to understand something related to cultural studies. It, it, it uh, talks about the, or it, it contests the, the constituted place of language and discourse within a culture. And um, it also talks about the decline of grand narratives and totalizing notions of inquiries. As I already told you, the notion of truth, the notion of history, the notion of um, you know, language, um, uh, the notion of authenticity, the notion of, um, fact, the notion of reality, etc. And there is also an equal stress on micro fields of political power and resistance, say, uh, subaltern resistance, um, like uh, the way in which uh, Mari Selvaraj has constructed in Pariyarum Parmal. In the very first scene, uh, a dog by name Karupi is, um, is, is crucified on the railway tracks. Uh, so this Karupi becomes uh, a cultural icon of the the whole oppressed uh, subaltern group. It 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 um, symbolically referred to the uh, victim of honor killing, Ilaverson, who was killed in very brutally, um, excruciatingly in uh, I mean on a railway track. So this is how um, you know cultural studies was trying to uh, give emphasis for micro uh, fields of resistance. And uh, equal significance was given to new social movements and identity politics. Say, for example, the movement, um, uh, the Dravidian movement in Tamil uh, historiography. When you had, uh, um, you know, uh, hotels meant exclusively for the caste Hindus. Um, um, you know, uh, in, in our own place, there was a hotel called, uh, I forgot the name. It is still there, but it is closed. Uh, Brahmanal Coffee Sapid Madam, which, which means it is meant only for uh, the caste Hindus. Uh, to counter this kind of uh, Brahminical, vegetarian, hegemonic culture, the Dravidian, in the, in the, with the emergence of Dravidian movement, you know, started um, many uh, intermediary uh, caste groups started exercising their um, food, culinary skill. Uh, say Konarkadai, Nadarmes, Tevarmes, uh, all these 
um, you know, the, the, the uh, minor social movements and the, the new social movements and identity uh, politics also, um, the, the cultural studies group tried giving uh, its emphasis. And the uh, instability of meaning uh, in language and its stresses, as I initially began my lecture, uh, it, it, it emphasizes on the politics of difference. So instead of reaching the universal uh, the, or, or homogenized kind of human experience, it gives a lot of emphasis to the politics of difference and uh, the discursive construction of identity and social life. So um, uh, with this, I'll conclude my um, lecture on cultural studies. If there are any questions from the audience, I'm happy to respond to those questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It was undoubtedly a wonderful session. I'll now pose select questions from the audience. So Mr. Dhyaneshwar, would like to ask this question. To what extent cultural studies is or are a celebration of plurality of cultures and hybridity? Yeah, <clears throat> it is um, like postmodernism, which celebrated um, the differences, uh, which, which celebrated the plur pluralities. Um, I don't say cultural studies actually celebrated the pluralities or uh, the differences, but it laid uh, an emphasis on the politics of difference, especially um, it, it laid uh, a special uh, emphasis or a stress on the micro fields of uh, political power and uh, the, the resistance from minor groups. So the, the essential uh, objective of cultural studies is to um, say, is, is, is to signify or is to um, uh, talk about the instability of uh, meaning in language and also to uh, keep stressing on the politics of difference, but it doesn't um, try to celebrate the uh, pluralities or uh, the differences. It, it, it simply says that uh, from every trivial or hitherto trivialized uh, cultural, um, like the, what, whatever, you know, uh, whatever have been, um, you know, marked as mundane uh, carries a lot of messages to uh, to the people so um, if we cannot brush aside somebody's experiences as mass so in the in the name of mass or in the name of mass culture um, you, you cannot uh, try to manipulate the uh, the, the uh, human mind so um, each and every uh, culture has its own uniqueness and that uniqueness should be brought out and uh, one culture uh, should be studied or should be read, should be understood only in terms of uh, some other culture. So, um, so when when a lot of cultures try to when a lot of subcultures try to contest within a culture, um, it's it's not celebration of one culture over the other. It's not a celebration of all cultures equally. Also, we should respect the differences and we should try to um, we should try to understand uh, specifically uh, with regard to literary. Um, studies, literary critical studies, we should try to understand that uh, a text or say a man and his experience should be interpreted uh, not just, um, you know, uh, in terms of himself, but in terms of his culture. So the socio-cultural historical melee becomes important uh, and, and, and the emphasis is on uh, the the positionality of the production of literature. Thank you, sir. We have another question from Dr. Muttukumar M. Uh, he asks if you agree with the idea that cultural study encourages creative interpretation of a text. Yes, yes, yes. Certainly, because 
um, as you see the life of uh, these um, these pioneers of cultural studies uh, school uh, it, it basically emerges not from uh, literary critics but from creative writers so uh, these creative writers turned literary critics uh, formed this school and they tried to um, read certain texts from um, the, the perspective of cultural studies or from the cultural studies perspective. Um, I give you an example of this when um, uh, Raymond Williams, you know, when, when, when he believes that some new elitist notions, uh, say popularized by uh, far Louise like uh, people in his, uh, in his mass uh, civilization and minority culture, um, then um, Coleridge's proposals for um, a, a class whose business should be general cultivation. Um, it, it's like monopolizing knowledge. It's like monopolizing truth. It's like monopolizing wisdom. Uh, Carlyle's proposal for an organic literary class. So when these Arnold's proposal to uh, reawaken modern Philistines, all these people were trying to um, earmark a specific class or a group as uh, productive forces of knowledge. Um, so that uh, perhaps was uh, well, the, the very notion was uh, disturbed and uh, shattered when new uh, cultural studies group emerged. So yes, yes, uh, it's, it's there. Thank you, sir. We have another question, sir. If cultural study is a politized form of historiography, how can we identify the textuality of history? Uh, <clears throat> I didn't, uh, I didn't um, talk more on new historicism because um, I know you have uh, allotted the topic to another uh, speaker. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to get into his shoes, but um, new historicism is an entirely different uh, field, though uh, cultural studies um, you know, becomes interdisciplinary involving the process of historiography. Or with the incorporation of E.P. Thompson in the, in the cultural studies group, um, there is an interchange of ideas and uh, interchange of uh, you know, theorization, the theories uh, between um, cultural studies and new historicism. But um, new historicism uh, you know, talks uh, more about the, um, the, the authenticity of the, uh, the so-called official histories that came from above. So with E.P. Thompson's essay, History from Below, you know, for the first time, people started um, examining history or the production of history uh, from below. So the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the history of India, for example, when you write history of India, somebody is writing from the colonizer's point of view and somebody else is writing from the colonized subject's point of view. But then there is, a, there is a difference between these two things. And when the colonizers after 70 years of, uh, I mean, independence and uh, 200 years of exploitation, they can very rightfully say that, uh, please forgive us for our sins. They use the term sins for their colonial project, for their process of colonization. Whereas when the internal um, you know, subjects, when the colonized subjects, when the exploited subjects, when the enslaved people resisted this kind of a hegemony, the process of colonization, their acts were not treated as sins, but crimes, and they were thrown out of the land to penal islands. And, you know, so this kind of, uh, even, even from the Indian perspective, if somebody writes Indian historiography, that historiography has been written from the point of view of uh, the political leaders uh, more often uh, through the eyes of uh, Gandhi. So it, it's, a, it's a giant, it's a meta project, it's a massive project that many literary writers group in themselves to uh, write or to, to express um, the, to narrate the um, struggles related to India's freedom struggle only through the eyes of uh, Gandhi. 
to project Gandhi as the uh, conscience speaker of the uh, seeker of the nation. So, um, and then nobody uh, talks about the the subaltern uprisings, uh, re the regional uprisings, and the regional resistance to the colonizers. Um, so, even Veerapandi Kattumamensis resistance, we all came to know only through. Uh, the filming of the uh, regional um, uh, resistance, uh, the, the minor king. So this is how um, the new historicism is trying to bring out the hitherto neglected uh, forms of, uh, you know, historical episodes uh, from below by 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 challenging the uh, the notion of uh, authenticity. In the uh, in, in in history, in official histories, and uh, also saying that um, any history is only uh, a, a recounting of the past in the version of the other. So it it is not uh, it is not ultimate and it is not authentic. It is not ultimate and hence it is not authentic. Uh, there are many versions for the same kind of history, but cultural studies doesn't talk about this kind of multiplicity of um, a single fact. It talks about the, the nuanced, the trivial uh, forms uh, in which the same text can be understood. So there is a, uh, there is a difference. It's, it's a thin veneer that disconnects these two, but there is a difference. Thank you, sir. That will be it for the Q&A. I now invite Dr. Santosh Priya J, Assistant Professor of English, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Kavya. It is my privilege to propose the vote of thanks for the second day of the seven-day faculty development program on literary theory organized by the Literary and Debating Association Department of English, PSGR Krishnamal College for Women, Coimbatore. My pronouns to the founders, Sri G. R. Govindarajalu and Sri Mati Chandragandhi Govindarajalu for their vision to empower women through education. And we are indebted to them for their vision. My sincere thanks to our managing trustee, Shri G. Rangaswamy and our chairperson, Dr. R. Nandini, for the munificent support towards the growth of the institution. My warm gratitude to Dr. N. Eshoda Devi, the secretary, and Dr. S. Nirmala, the principal, who are the pillars of our institution. Our special thanks to our mentor, Dr. R. Padmavati, Dean, Academic Support and Alumni Relations. Our hearty thanks to the chief guest of the day, Dr. T. Marx, Professor of English, Pondicherry University, Puducherry, for the vivid presentation of significant ideas on cultural studies. Sir, you have well brought out through numerous examples from Kanagi to Shakespeare, Toni Morrison, and many others to connect the umbrella term cultural studies with pop culture, politics, arts, literature, sociology, history, anthropology, gender studies, and other disciplines. We are grateful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation delivering a remarkable lecture and patiently clarifying the doubts raised by the audience. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Sushil Mary Mathis, head of the Department of English for being a source of all our inspiration and forward looking endeavors. We thank you, dear ma'am, my sincere thanks to each and every faculty member from various institutions all over India for your active participation through Zoom platform 
and YouTube live stream. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your overwhelming response. Thank you. I thank the faculty members from the Department of English, PSJR Krishnamal College for Women for the meticulous work done. Thank you, dear colleagues. My hearty thanks to Dr. Madangi, Assistant Professor of English and Staff Coordinator of Literary and Debating Association for her untiring efforts in organizing programs. Thank you, dear Madangi. I extend my profound appreciation to the technical team for the support. Thank you, dear Kavya and others. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, I thank you on behalf of the organizing committee too, and truly appreciate the dedicated efforts of academicians like you who go the extra mile through kindness and generosity to enrich the teaching fraternity. We did have shortage of time, but you've made everything look so lucid and wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, sir. Until we meet again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank sir. you, sir. Dear participants, the link to post the attendance and feedback has been shared in the chat box of Zoom and YouTube as well. This link will be open for 30 minutes from now. Kindly enter your submissions by then. Thank you.